Good morning and welcome to today's pre-launch news conference for the launch of NASA's next tracking and data relay satellite, the TDRS-M spacecraft, which will launch on top of a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. I'm Katherine Hamilton from NASA's Office of Communications. The Atlas V rocket is ready to lift off tomorrow morning at 8.03 a.m. Eastern Time during a 40-minute window from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station here in Florida. Joining me here at Kennedy Space Center today to talk about the mission and how preparations for tomorrow's launch are progressing are Tim Dunn, Launch Director at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Badri Yunus, Deputy Associate Administrator for Space Communications and Navigation at NASA Headquarters in Washington, Dave Littman, Project Manager for TDRS M at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. James Wilson III, Boeing Program Manager for NASA Civil Space Programs. Scott Messer, ULA Program Manager for NASA Missions. And Clay Flynn, Launch Weather Officer with the 45th Space Wing at Cape Canaveral. After opening comments, we'll take your questions. Uh, for those on the phone, please press star one at any time to be entered into the queue for questions. Tim, would you start us off? Thank you, Catherine. Well, welcome and good morning. I'm proud to be here today representing the women and men of NASA's Launch Services Program. And I'm thrilled to be the launch director for the TGSM mission. Working alongside our United Launch Alliance colleagues, the engineers and analysts of NASA LSP take great pride in launching the next satellite in the TDRS constellation. NASA has a terrific record flying on Atlas V. We've successfully launched 14 missions on this magnificent rocket. Missions to Pluto, Jupiter, the Moon, the Sun, the radiation belts, three spacecraft to Mars, the asteroid Bennu, as well as two previous TDRS spacecraft. TDRS M will be the 15th NASA mission on Atlas V and the 72nd Atlas V mission overall. TDRS M will launch on an Atlas V 401 configuration vehicle from Space Launch Complex 41, affectionately known as Slick 41. That launch pad has hosted 58 Atlas V launches to date. Now I'd like to show a video with some great shots of the spacecraft, as well as the ULA crew receiving and assembling the Atlas V launch vehicle and mating the TDRSIM spacecraft at Complex 41. Please roll the tape. Okay, here we are just under two months ago with the arrival of the TDRSIM spacecraft over at the Space Coast Regional Airport in Titusville. The satellite was flown from California on this Air Force C-17 aircraft. And from the runway here, it's just a short drive over to Astrotech facility, the spacecraft payload processing. Here you see the arrival a few days later down at Port Canaveral uh, of the Atlas V first stage booster as well as the second stage Centaur. These Atlas V stages are manufactured at ULA's factory in Decatur, Alabama and transported to the Cape via the Mariner ship. Here you see the first stage offloaded and transported over to the ASOC. Back over at Astrotech in Titusville, you get a glamour shot here of Tedris M in the processing bay. And then uh, after about two weeks of processing on the first stage at the ASOC, we rolled out the first stage Atlas V booster and did what we call LVOS, launch vehicle on stand, uh, putting it onto the mobile launch platform in the vertical integration facility. The next day, we roll out with the integrated second stage, uh, the OVI, we call it, uh, take it out to the VIF and made it to the top of the first stage. You see the ULA crew here working very carefully. Back at Astrotech, uh, another great shot of the final encapsulation sequence of the TDRSIM spacecraft, uh, getting it ready to take out to the VIF for mate to the rocket. And there we are just last week on the 9th of August, uh, raising uh, and mating the encapsulated assembly of the spacecraft to the top of the Atlas V rocket. Uh, really great work by the entire team to get us to that point. 
Well, the TGSM launch campaign has been exciting. Uh, we uh, encountered a incident uh, during processing over at AstroTech that delayed us. Uh, we had planned on launching around the first part of August. Uh, and I want to say that the team did an incredible job uh, to get us back on track after that. I would like to point out in, in particular uh, the Air Force uh, working with the range here at the Eastern Range, as well as United Launch Alliance working their manifest, were able to uh, fit us back into a very busy uh, range schedule during the month of August. So it's, uh, it's really great within our launch community when we can all come together and help each other out. So I would like to reach out to uh, my our colleagues over at SpaceX as well as the folks that are working the Minotaur 4 launch uh, because uh, earlier this week there was a SpaceX launch and later next week there will be a Minotaur 4 ORS 5 launch from the Cape. Both missions uh, really did some accommodation to fit us in to enable uh, an opportunity for us to launch tomorrow. So in the past week since we did Spacecraft Mate, the Atlas V team has been busy with a lot of launch preps. Last Friday, we performed the integrated systems test between the spacecraft and rocket, and the combined NASA and ULA launch team held our flight readiness review, where we assessed all processing and pre-launch preps for the mission. Earlier this week, on Tuesday morning, we conducted the launch readiness review for the mission. Senior managers from NASA KSC, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, NASA headquarters, as well as United Launch Alliance and the Air Force assessed all phases of the mission uh, to enable us to proceed with launch tomorrow. On Tuesday afternoon, we did our mission dress rehearsal. We exercised and prepared the entire team for launch. Yesterday, we began our final launch preps at 9 a.m. Eastern Time when we rolled the Atlas V on its mobile launch platform out of the VIF, about a quarter mile to the north to the launch pad. And then the crew deftly navigated local thunderstorm activity and safely loaded approximately 26,000 gallons of RP-1 fuel on the first stage. If you were here in the local area yesterday, you know what that activity was all about. Later tonight, the launch crew will begin arriving on console and begin with the power on sequence for the spacecraft. The crew will then perform final preps for the Atlas V power on and electrical checks beginning about 1 a.m. early tomorrow morning. This will be followed around 5.30 a.m. by loading of the super cold cryogenic propellants on board Atlas V. We'll start with the liquid oxidizer, liquid oxygen into the tanks of the first and second stages, and then we'll begin uh, loading the fuel, the liquid hydrogen, into the second stage Centaur. Final flight control tests will be performed along with final tests with Eastern Range instrumentation and then we'll be ready for launch tomorrow morning at 8.03 a.m. Eastern Time with a 40-minute window. To summarize, the spacecraft, the Atlas V rocket, and all range equipment are ready, and the combined government and contractor launch team is prepared to launch TDRS-M, a critical national asset for space communications. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Tim. And next, uh, Badri Yunus will tell us a bit about the Space Network. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Tim. We are counting on you. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully, by, by this time tomorrow, we'll all be celebrating the successful launch of Tidris M, the new addition to the SCAN family. SCAN is the headquarter program that's responsible for all of NASA's space communication and navigation. At, uh, within SCAN, we manage all, all, of, NASA, all of NASA's uh, space communication networks, that include the Deep Space Network, the Near Earth Network, as well as the Space Network. They all cater to different kind of users. The Deep Space Network supports missions that are billions of miles away, sending very faint signals to Earth and giving us some data about the universe and primarily scientific data. The Near Earth Network is a little bit more robust, supporting anything between Earth and the Moon and a little bit beyond. Uh, supporting primarily missions that do not require uh, global coverage or near real-time support. The space network is the youngest of all networks, and it has two components, the ground infrastructure and a fleet of data relaying satellite, uh, of which TDRS-M uh, is going to be a member of this family. 
So TDRS M is going to be uh, critical to our future uh, operation uh, and the future of the space network. Next chart. I would like to you to see some charts about the history of launching uh, the TDRS spacecraft and where we are in terms of uh, fleet capacity. Okay, here you here you go. Uh, we have three generations of uh, spacecraft that uh, are somehow different in their uh, functional uh, performance, but architecturally they are the same. Uh, launched since the early uh, 1980 uh, with the first generation uh, TDRSs, and we have, uh, they have been operating for more than 20 years. Some of them are retired, some are sitting in storage having limited capability, um, and uh, all of them have been launched, you know, uh, by the year 1995. The second generation uh, TDRSs, they have been launched also on an Atlas uh, launch vehicle at Atlas 2A, and they are still operating and operating pretty uh, robustly, um, you know, and they are already active, provide an active support to NASA Space Network uh, uh, customer community. The last of the TDRS generation is the third generation, of which TDRS M is a member and we are hoping it will be launched successfully and will be deployed and will take its place among the start supporting its, you know, its brothers and sisters in performing their function. It's critical because the space network, as you see in the middle of that chart, uh, depends on TDRS to do its function. We need at least six uh, spacecraft you know, six active, active spacecraft and one active spare. So we need seven spacecraft to be ready to meet all of our mission requirements. Uh, we have most of the uh, first generation will have been retired and sent to a super sync orbit where we retire our spacecraft. And we'll, we may have some residual capability, so TDRS M is so critical. You know, without any undue pressure, Tim, I definitely need this spacecraft. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and, and while we are deploying uh, TDRS M, we are already working, next chart please, on the next generation uh, uh, architectural capability, the next uh, generation communication uh, networks, and in particular, uh, the next generation data relaying uh, capability. Over the past a uh, few years, NASA has been investing very heavily in transformational technology, such as optical communication, quantum uh, entanglement, uh, smart radios and cognitive radios, as well as robust communication systems. We are um, working toward an architecture where we have m more robustness and where the users and the, uh, you know, our level are uh, communicating um, robustly with, through a data relay satellite or sending their um, data directly to their mission operations center. But having the flexibility to go anywhere, uh, anywhere where you have a channel uh, available and uh, to provide them optimum support. We are working with other government entities to build similar uh, capabilities and will build into the same standards as well as well as we are working with the commercial sector to adopt these standards and to adopt the, uh, the technology to provide seamless interoperable environment to our users in the future. NASA is working very heavily to this endeavor and we have declared the next decade to be the decade of light as we intend to light up the communication highways all over you know, the solar system. So, uh, next chart. Much of the data you can see at, at our website that I provide for you to, to please visit and, and see the wonderful things we are doing as well as the <coughs> technology advances we made. And next chart, please. Um, you know, last but not least, I'd like to, to thank Tim and the entire launch services uh, folks uh, to include ULA and the LSP and as well as the, the spacecraft folks, you know, from our project office, the TDRS project office, and the Boeing, for a wonderful job they have done. We are, we are keeping our fingers crossed, but great folks, you know, and thousands of hours 
you know, have, have gone into it to get us where we are now. Tomorrow, we expect it to be a successful day, and we are going to have a major celebration by the end of today. Thank you. Thank you. And next, Dave Lippman will tell us more about Tidris itself. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Tim and Badri. It's really great to be here again, back down at the Cape, for another launch of Tigris. Um, we were here a couple of years ago for the launch of Tigris K and L, as Badri mentioned, 2013, 2014. So it's been a couple of years, but those were great launches. Uh, they are operating very well in the space network. We did look at the telemetry coverage planned for the launch tomorrow, and Tigris K and Tigris L will be watching Tigris M and tracking the launch vehicle uh, as it as for our successful launch. And so we kind of made, made a comment at the at the flight readiness review about what Tigris M might think of that, knowing that it's uh, two siblings uh, we're going to watch over, uh, seeing it come up, um, to, you know, on the launch vehicle. So that generated a little smile across the team. But it's great that we've got two great spacecraft, K and L, and we're looking forward to the third one uh, tomorrow. Um, the first seven Tidris, as Badri mentioned, uh, were launched on the Space Shuttle program, which has been retired. Um, we've uh, retired at least two of, our, of the first seven. Um, we still have a number of those, though, that are still operating well beyond design life. In addition, Tidris uh, H, I, and J uh, was the second generation built by the Boeing Company. And those are operating, as Badri mentioned. And Tedris K and L, I just mentioned, um, were launched 2013 and 14, also built by the Boeing Company. And those are operating very well uh, in addition to that. So we have a great constellation, but we need one more, for at least for now. Badri's got plans, as he, as he mentioned, to, uh, you know, to maybe change paradigm of technology and to continue our uh, communications you know, and uh, increase the data rates and increase the number of users and bandwidth and discoveries that uh, are enabled by, by the space communication that we have. So what I do have um, is a little bit of video on the processing of our spacecraft uh, here at Astrotech. Some of it you'll kind of, there may be a little bit of an overlay here, but this is the spacecraft arriving, as Tim mentioned here, June 23rd, and it's, it's taken off the spacecraft, and put on a land all trailer and taken over to Astrotech, uh, where we process the spacecraft. Um, it's in this container, it's shipped, and I think what you'll see here is them lifting the cover off of the uh, transport container, and the spacecraft is shipped and it's horizontal. It's on a strong back. From when we were in the, from there we, we raise it to a vertical position and where we put it onto our fueling stand. And that is where our processing takes place. Um, you'll see this here. Um, we did encounter one issue here, um, you know, at which we worked through. And, uh, you know, following, uh, getting through that activity that uh, Tim mentioned, um, we were ready to feed, you know, ready to kind of move to a transport condition. And you can see the encapsulation here. Uh, you saw that a little bit on this on Tim's video. Um, what folks will tell me, though, is the, the engineers that have spent years and thousands of hours building the spacecraft, this is the last time they physically are able to see it. The next time we will see it is on orbit through our displays in mission control. Um, this is the spacecraft, and it's in an encapsulated state. Um, and then it's being lifted up here on a crane and put onto the uh, transport vehicle where it is taken to the VIF, and that you saw Tim uh, showed them the lift and mate. Once we launch, um, we have a second little video to come up here. Once we separate from the Atlas vehicle, um, we, we go through a series of orbit raising activities. Here we can see that we're spinning uh, about five RPMs per second, and then we're released. And the first thing we do is we unfurl our antennas, and then we raise our orbit. We have five apogee burns where we raise our orbit to geosynchronous orbit. And once we are raised, then we start our deployments. And here's our north solar wing. Then we deploy our SA antennas, the large reflectors. From there, we deploy our south solar wing. And then come, um, out come our omni antenna and the space to ground link antenna. Um, from there, we have a full spacecraft. And it takes about three to four months following deployments for us to fully characterize the spacecraft and to show that it will meet mission requirements and provide the RF performance that is uh, needed to uh, support our users. That activity is done over at the White Sands Complex. Um, and then after acceptance of the spacecraft from the Boeing Company, then it is turned over to our sister organization, the Space Network, to operate the vehicle. It becomes a member of our constellation. Thank you. Uh, next, James Wilson III will talk a little bit about Boeing's role in the TDRS. Thanks, Catherine. 
Uh, it is truly an honor to be here uh, representing the Bo Boeing Company and uh, the Tedris team. Uh, there are thousands of people behind me uh, who have supported this program to bring us to this point. Um, you know, it's really exciting to, to be up here as part of this panel, uh, see the teamwork of, of folks, our partnership with NASA, partnership with ULA, that really brings this incredible sense of, of pride in our national asset, uh, pride in what we're doing, and uh, it really brings smiles to our faces when we get together and talk about uh, the things that we do. It, it, um, it really brings everyone excitement. It's a long time getting here. Uh, once the contract is signed, uh, we go through an extensive design period. Uh, we integrate the satellite, we test it, and then bring it to launch site. But we're not done. As Dave showed in the previous video, uh, there's several months of on-orbit test. And so uh, there's quite a bit of activity that uh, will follow launch. It's an excite exciting time for us uh, to go through this activity. Um, but there's an entire mission team awaiting to catch that satellite uh, somewhere over India and uh, take it on the rest of its way to its final orbit. Um, this is the sixth satellite that uh, Boeing has delivered to NASA for TDRS. And we've been the exclusive provider uh, of, of TDR satellites since 1995. That is uh, an incredible feat. Uh, Boeing, Boeing is, has, has enjoyed the relationship with NASA, uh, and uh, the continued relationship, I think, will be good for, for both entities. It's important to know, though, that TDRS M, this satellite, represents the last of our 601 fleet. The 601s were first launched in 1992. And now here in 2017, we launched the last one. Um, I started out on 601s when I was a, a young engineer. We'll see some, some pictures in High Bay. And uh, it's uh, incredibly in, uh, in th um, exciting for me as, a, as an engineer, as now as a manager, uh, to have gone through that and see the final, final launch. Uh, as I said, we have an excellent uh, team in place with NASA. And, uh, and ULA, and, and we look forward to continuing our relationship uh, with you guys. Now, I also have a video, and we can take a look at what it looks like to uh, build and test uh, satellites in our factory. So we roll the tape. So uh, here we're gonna go through uh, a little bit of a high bay tour, is what we call the factory, and walk you through some of the things that uh, TDRS has gone through. So here we are, uh, we're sitting on the end of an end bell, and the satellite is prepped for spacecraft thermal vac. We put it in a very large chamber. You can see it being lifted up there. And in this chamber, we simulate the space environment. We pump down to a vacuum. We heat it. We cool it. We make sure that the spacecraft systems can preserve itself. And then we go over to vibration. And vibration, we simul simulate what it's like to ride on the rocket. And you can see in the video that the antennas are shaking pretty good there. Uh, we simulate all the different axes that the, the spacecraft will, will see and make sure that it's structurally sound and ready to go into flight. We put it uh, on what we call a rollover fixture, and it sits on some air pads, and it allows us to move it around in the factory. Um, and uh, we do our deployments, and we simulate the uh, exercise, the, all the, the appendages that'll come out in flight, like Dave showed in the previous video. And then, of course, once it's all buttoned up, um, we put it on its adapter and attach the clamp band, and then uh, put it in the container. And so here you see us rolling into the containerization room. Uh, it takes quite a bit of, of uh, people to watch all the pieces, make sure we go through the doors properly and make sure that we lift it properly. And so here we are lifting the spacecraft from its four corners and they'll move it onto the container and uh, again, reattach it. And you can see the guys very carefully making sure that we're perfectly precise in our attachment and making sure that we have all the proper torques. And then we roll it over and secure it for, for transport to the, uh, to the launch site. For extra safe measure, we put a, a mylar cover over it to make sure that uh, uh, there's no, no dust or, or condensation that could perhaps get on the spacecraft. And then we put a very heavy cover on the top of the container. And you can see the guys there being very careful to make sure that we align it properly before bringing it down. Attach the clamps, and we are ready to go on a trailer. So we roll the semi-truck in, lift it up, and hopefully you're getting a sense of how big this is. Uh, this is quite a large uh, device, and I can imagine what the people are thinking on the freeway as they see it roll down the road. What could possibly be in that thing? 
Little do they know, it is a beautiful spacecraft ready for launch. So, uh, you know, it's just an incredible time for us. Uh, it's a brief moment of launch that we see this bright flame in the sky. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, this is a, a very exciting time to know that, uh, you know, I started off on 601s. I remember walking through the high bay and uh, getting my first tour on my, on my interview. And I asked the, the, uh, the uh, guy that was walking me through, what am I going to do every day? And he pointed to a guy that was standing in the middle of a satellite with just his legs showing. He said, you're going to do that every day. And that's an incredible thing when you think about um, coming up and you work hard to get through college and school, and then you get the opportunity to do such a very, very cool thing. And now here we are at launch, uh, getting to see all these complex machines come together uh, to, uh, to put this asset in space, and then um, hand it over to our customer with you know, a feeling of a job well done. So we're looking forward to a great mission. Go Atlas. Go Teacher Sam. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from James Wilson III to talk a little bit about launch preparations for Atlas and what to expect during launch. Well, if you want me Scott to do Messer, again, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, to Scott Messer from ULA. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, on behalf of United Launch Alliance, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Tedris M launch tomorrow. It's a thrill for me personally to be here. Just uh, one day away from, from this uh, launch of this great uh, TDRA satellite, which is a critical asset uh, for the United States of America and, and all of space. Uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, we have rolled the vehicle out to the pad yesterday and completed all of our uh, closeout preparations. So at the moment, the vehicle is just sitting over there waiting for us to, uh, to get there this evening and begin the, the processing. This will be the 72nd launch of an Atlas V vehicle for uh, the United Launch Alliance. And uh, of those uh, 72 vehicles, 37 have been the 401 configuration. So 401 configuration has definitely been the, the, work for, uh, the workhorse of the Atlas family. Uh, is delivering uh, a little over half of the, uh, the Atlas missions to date. Uh, so the 401 has uh, got several components. Uh, it's, first of all, a four-meter fairing, which houses the, the Tedris spacecraft. It is powered by a, the first stage, uh, which has uh, an RD Amros RD-180 uh, engine. And uh, then the second stage, the Centaur second stage, which is powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10C engine. This uh, vehicle, performance-wise, does not require any strap-on uh, boosters. Uh, the Atlas vehicle is very flexible in that way to match the, just the right vehicle with the performance needs of, of the spacecraft. So with that, we'll take a minute uh, and see a video that will show some of the, will show the actual flight profile that we expect tomorrow. The following profile details the important events of this mission using approximate times. Two, we have ignition and we have liftoff of the United... The Atlas V RD-180 main engine ignites to lift the vehicle away from the pad. Shortly after liftoff, Atlas begins its initial pitch, yaw, and roll maneuvers to attain the proper ascent profile and minimize aerodynamic loads. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1, the speed of sound at 80 seconds. At 92 seconds, the vehicle experiences maximum dynamic pressure. Approaching booster engine cutoff, the Atlas V is burning propellant at a rate of 1,600 pounds per second, traveling at over 11,000 miles per hour, and located 61 miles in altitude and 148 miles downrange. Booster engine cutoff occurs four minutes, two seconds after liftoff. The booster stage is jettisoned six seconds later. 10 seconds after booster separation, the first Centaur main engine start takes place. The payload fairing is jettisoned eight seconds later. The vehicle now weighs just 8% of what it did at liftoff four and a half minutes earlier. Cutoff of the Centaur main engine occurs nearly 18 minutes after launch. The mission now enters a one and a half hour coast phase. At just over one hour, 48 minutes, 
the Centaur main engine is restarted. This burn will last less than a minute. Following the second Centaur main engine cutoff, at 1 hour 49 seconds, the mission enters a nearly 4 minute coast phase in preparation for spacecraft separation. At approximately 1 hour 53 minutes, Centaur releases NASA's Tedris M satellite. Thank you. So uh, this will be the fifth launch for uh, United Launch Alliance uh, in 2017 and the 120th successful launch of, since the company was formed in 2006. I do want to say that uh, United Launch Alliance, we are honored to deliver this uh, basic agency capability. Uh, we're excited because, it, as mentioned, it enables our missions as well, the Tedris spacecraft uh, up there, all six of them, or seven of them, I guess, uh, monitor the Atlas vehicle and our telemetry. And so it's exciting for us to launch something that will actually enable our missions. Um, I will tell you our team is uh, laser focused on uh, mission success and reliability. United Launch Alliance, uh, we pride ourselves on uh, making sure that uh, every mission is successful. We, we treat it, every mission as a unique satellite and a unique mission. But we also recognize that our success is uh, because of our partnerships with NASA and uh, spacecraft partners like Boeing. And so just want to uh, get a thanks out there to the NASA team and the Boeing team for uh, working with us to get to this point. Um, we look forward to tomorrow to maintaining our 100% mission success record and continuing our unmatched uh, reliability. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn the time over to Clay to uh, tell us uh, what weather looks like tomorrow. So, Clay. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the weather is favorable for tomorrow's count. Uh, the high pressure axis is suppressed to the south. What that will do for us is give us westerly flow. Generally, during the summer months, westerly flow is favorable, as any type of nocturnal showers that develop over the Atlantic should tend to stay out to the east. So really, we'll, we probably will see some showers and maybe an isolated thunderstorm or two out to the east. I'll show you a satellite picture here momentarily. Uh, but again, I believe they will stay to the east given the westerly flow. Uh, that high pressure axis lifts a little bit to the north over the next 24 hours. What that will do for us is really collapse our winds. Our winds will be relatively light during the overnight hours. We should be out of the south to southwest as we're on the, as, during the count. Uh, by the time we get to near T0, we should be gusting out of the southwest gusting to about 12 knots. That's well below the liftoff constraint, so really uh, pretty favorable conditions during the overnight hours. If I could have the satellite picture brought up, please. Uh, as I was mentioning, if you look out to the east of the peninsula, there is a surface feature, a surface trough there, and you can see the clouds and showers, and there are some isolated thunderstorms out there. That feature should stay in that general vicinity over the next 24 hours, but again, with our westerly flow, we'd expect to see uh, the showers and the storms remaining to, uh, to our east. Uh, the system that you see to the west there, approaching Louisiana, will migrate to the east, but uh, for the most part, that's going to stay to our north. and. Uh, uh, with broad surface troughing to our north. So really not going to be a player for us Friday or Saturday. Uh, more significant, which is really going to be our principal concern uh, for launch during, during the count tomorrow and, and as we're in the window, is the northeasterly flow. Uh, the north, we're northeasterly above 15,000 feet or so, and it looks like we should, we should get an influx of moisture in the mid and upper levels. So with that influx of moisture, the, the principal concern would just be an increase in, uh, in thick clouds as they migrate in. Now, there's really not a high threat of that. It's about a 20 percent likelihood. So as I mentioned, it looks pretty favorable for tomorrow. We just have to monitor those thick clouds and uh, see if they exceed criteria, but expecting them to stay uh, below criteria. So if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the forecast for tomorrow, we'd just be looking for a few clouds at 3,000 feet, uh, scatter deck at 22,000 feet, and that's really the deck that we'd be concerned about uh, between zero and minus 20 degrees Celsius with another broken deck about 32,000 feet or so. Should have good visibility. It's going to be warm. Temperature should be about 80 to 81 uh, when we hit liftoff tomorrow with a 20 percent chance of violation. And as I mentioned, that's a thick cloud rule violation we'd be concerned with that we'll be monitoring. Next slide, please. Should we delay for 24-hour delay? Uh, conditions look fairly similar to uh, Saturday that they do to uh, Friday. So really similar conditions, about a 20% chance of violation. Again, that would be thick cloud uh, uh, layer concern. 
uh, our winds will be a little more southerly as that high pressure axis lifts to the north our winds should go a little more southerly from the south southwest about from about 200 degrees but still relatively light well below any liftoff constraints gusting to about 10 uh, to 12 knots so as in summary then the weather looks fairly favorable for tomorrow and should we be on the pad for a 24 hour delay looks favorable as well uh, Catherine Thank you. Uh, we'll now open it up for questions for those in the room and those on the phone. Uh, if you're on the phone, please press star one to be entered into the queue. Uh, when the mic comes to you, please uh, state your name and affiliation and to whom your question is directed. Start over here. Um, hello, this is Marcia Dunn of the Associated Press. I'm not sure who to address this to, but could you explain how the antenna on the spacecraft ended up broken? And I know there was an investigation. What did that conclude? I I'm happy to take that. Okay. Uh, yes, the antenna was damaged by bumping up against a piece of ground support equipment. The antenna has been uh, removed, replaced, and retested functioning nominally. Um, what ground equipment was it? What, was it a crane or how? Could you give a few more details of exactly what happened? Yes, it was, uh, it was prepping to lift the satellite, and the crane did come down and touch it. And lastly, is the investigation ongoing, or has that been concluded? Oh, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, we've, uh, we've concluded all the investigation for TDRS. All the, uh, the incident has been contained. Our review board has met and uh, completed all its activity and closed the issue. Thank you. We'll take a, a one, one quick TDRS question. Um, so is it for sure there will be no TDRS in? That's sort of what it sounds like, or is it maybe, or how, do, how does that? There were, uh, there were two options. The uh, contract was for two spacecraft, TDRS K, TDRS L. There were options for M and N. The M option obviously was exercised, which is why we're here today. The N option was not exercised. Well, the deployment of satellites depends on the requirements. At this moment, there is no need for a uh, TDRS N, but we are seeing a need for uh, additional data relaying capability around the 2025 time frame. So we have time to insert the transformational technology I, I talked about and proceed with a new sets of capabilities, doing the same role that the TDRS is doing, which is uh, tracking and data relaying capability but in a more robust way. Go over there. Uh, Bill Harwood, CBS News. Uh, for mm -hmm. Mr. Just to follow up on Marsha's question for Mr. Wilson, um, was the antenna actually broken, or was this just a matter of being extra cautious uh, because it got nudged and you, did, you were just playing it safe, or was there a physical defect in the antenna? And I'm assuming this is human error. Yeah, there was no defect in the antenna. The antenna was delivered. Uh, no, I mean, after it was pumped. Was yeah. there something wrong with it or not? That's what uh, yeah, there is a protective cap that was damaged. So there was, there was some uh, minor damage to the antenna, uh, but that, an, that antenna was completely replaced and retested. And, and human error, is that, or was there a machine malfunction in the lift? Um, we have very strict process control at Boeing. Um, and so uh, we looked at our processes and made sure that, that the processes were um, revisited and enhanced to make sure that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. If that's not what I asked, I mean, was it human error or was there a machine problem? Uh, there was no machine problem. Okay, thanks. And for Marjorie, just a real quick one. I'm, how many TDRS satellites are currently actually relaying data? I'm, I'm confused in terms of the ones that are partially operable versus fully operable. Yeah, we definitely have approximately seven spacecraft that are active. Uh, six are providing real-time support to, uh, to our customers, and one is a hot uh, spare, you know, on a standby. Uh, next, we'll take a question from the phone. Irene Klotz, your mic Hi. is open. Thanks very much. Um, uh, just to follow up for a minute, what do you mean by approximately seven, and how old is the oldest one that's currently uh, in the operational system? Thanks. Uh, I probably didn't get all of the questions. Uh, the sound was not coming clear. Irene, can you repeat the first part of your question, please? Yep. Is this better? Yes. Thanks. Um, I wanted to know uh, what you meant by approximately seven, and how old is the oldest satellite that's in the operational system? 
Well, the, all the satellites uh, they are, are part of the first generation uh, tracking and data relay satellite systems. And they are as old as, you know, they were launched in 1993 and 1995. When I talk approximately, um, not all of the uh, first generation satellites are operating uh, completely. You know, they have lost some of their capabilities. So we talk, when we talk about approximately, we look at the residual the capability of one mated with residual capability of the other to give us an equivalent uh, one data relay satellite capability. Um, so we need seven because we need two spacecraft per node. We have three nodes up in space uh, covering, uh, spanning the globe. Uh, theaters provide a global uh, support to anything that's flying be, uh, below the geosynchronous orbit. Thank did, you. Did I answer your question? Um, yes. You did, and I had a question also about the, uh, the damage to the TDRS antenna. Uh, what was the cost of a new antenna, and who is paying for that? Uh, I'm going to defer contractual uh, <laughs> issues to NASA. So I think with, res with respect to the antenna, um, there, there was an available antenna that was uh, um, identified by Boeing to, to be available that was brought over. and. Uh, evaluated and that it was suitable for the mission. As James has mentioned, uh, the uh, damaged antenna was removed and replaced. Um, and uh, they're basically repairing it. They have repaired it and uh, returned the uh, spacecraft to be ready for flight, ready for launch. Um, and uh, it's kind of, you know, it's Boeing spacecraft until the government accepts it. Uh, following on our on-orbit on acceptance testing that I mentioned takes about three or three or four months, as James mentioned, that we do uh, with our White Sands Complex uh, in, in New Mexico. Boeing brings a team out to the uh, White Sands Complex and we uh, check out the performance of the satellite there uh, and then have an on-orbit acceptance review uh, approximately, you know, four months uh, following the, uh, the launch. So, so Boeing um, is providing the, the spare replacement antenna and you don't expect an additional cost to NASA, is that right? There should yes, the, uh, the 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 contractual terms. You know, we, we're not. We, I won't go into the details here. But in in terms of it's all being handled under the contract, and the the government's uh, you know cost and and you know outlay is is, is identified there. And and there there's not uh, anything that I would kind of identify as as a as an addition here. Thanks very much. Thank you. We'll come back to you questions here in the room. We have a question in the back there. Hi, uh, Emery Kelly with, uh, with Florida Today. James, I think both of these might be for you. Um, in regards to the antenna, what, what does that antenna do? And uh, is there a, a specific, specific date in mind for when you would like this active? When I would like the antenna active? Or, or the, the whole satellite ready ah, to go. Okay. Great. Uh, well, really good question. Um, what, is the, what does the antenna do that was damaged? It actually has a pretty short lifespan um, uh, for its nominal use. This is an omnidirectional antenna uh, that provides uh, hemispherical coverage uh, for the forward part of the spacecraft. So when the spacecraft is in what we call transfer orbit, uh, let me define what transfer orbit is. After the, after the rocket drops us off, like I said, over India, it's on a path to get to geo, but it's not there yet. If we left it alone, it wouldn't, it wouldn't get to geo by itself. And so we do what's called a transfer orbit. And we use a 100-pound engine that's on the base of the, of the satellite to orbit rays up to geosynchronous orbit. All right, so during that time, it's about uh, eight days that we're doing, uh, doing these burns. So during this time, the satellite is not pointed at the Earth at all times. And, and a lot of the times when we're doing our burns, it's pointed uh, orthogonal to the Earth. And so during that time, the antenna is able to broadcast uh, toward the Earth. And we're able to receive the telemetry on the ground, uh, send up our commands, and, and do its job. And so really, it has somewhat of a short lifespan. Um, if for some reason uh, the satellite had some trouble uh, during its uh, nominal time when, when, when the uh, uh, spacecraft is pointed at the Earth, 
Um, that antenna is a backup for us to be able to communicate with it in case the satellite got into an orientation that was, was not predictable. And we have, we have two of these antennas. There's actually one on the aft part of the spacecraft and one on the forward. So we have uh, nearly four pi coverage, sorry, uh, spheri nearly spherical coverage uh, where we can get commands into the spacecraft and get telemetry out so we can effectively communicate, communicate with the satellite. That hit it? Great. Thank you. Uh, we'll go up here in the front now. Hi, Ken Kramer, Universe Today, Northeast Astronomy Forum. A um, couple of questions. One quick for Tim Dunn. First of all, if you uh, good luck tomorrow. Can you tell us what's the uh, scrub possibilities if we don't launch on the 18th, 18th and 19th? What is it beyond that? And, and uh, for the NASA gentleman, um, talk about the capabilities you want to develop in the future with the laser communication. What, what is it going to get us that we don't have now, and why do we need it? Thank you. And the breadth of satellites that you're currently serving with TDRS. Tell us about that. Thanks. Well, thanks, Ken. You could tell I was kind of lonesome down here because James and Dave were taking all the questions. So, uh, so uh, we, uh, we obviously have tomorrow as our first attempt uh, secured on the range as well as a backup opportunity on Saturday the 19th. Uh, as the range currently stands today, uh, we would then need to stand down for most of next week to allow Minotaur 4 uh, to launch uh, next Friday evening. They have, uh, they're somewhat new to the range, don't launch uh, from here very often, so they are using a lot of Eastern Range resources next week. Uh, so should they stay on track, uh, we would not have a launch opportunity next week. We would come in behind them uh, the following next weekend or likely early uh, the week of the 28th of August for our next attempt. However, as is usual, uh, if we weren't able to get off on Friday or Saturday, we would certainly petition the Eastern Range. Are there any other opportunities? How are your other customers doing? Uh, would they be able to accommodate a third attempt for us on Sunday, uh, possibly stand down on Sunday? So a lot of that uh, type of negotiation takes place uh, in the event of multiple scrubs. If I could just add to that, uh, so the Atlas vehicle has a 97 percent uh, demonstrated ability to get off uh, on the first attempt once we've gotten to this point. So while it's possible that we may have to do what Tim just said, we think the probabilities are very good that we'll get off in, in the two days we have. Okay. First, let me start with the customers that do use the tracking and data relay satellite system. We are talking about a number of uh, these uh, customers. They vary from a human space flight to science missions. Anything that requires low latency because of the ability of TDRS to relay in near real time uh, the data back to Earth. So uh, again, uh, the main beneficiary is the human space flight, the, the contact with the space station, the astronaut, the video conferencing that take place and the regular communications taking place with the space, with the International Space Station, with the astronauts, as well as the scientific uh, experiments that are being conducted there. The TDRS provides two types of service uh, services. One is uh, single access and the other multiple access. The single access allows us to go up in data rate to the 300, and now we are testing and implementing a 600 megabit per second, and in, uh, in, a, in a couple of years we'll have 1.2 gigabit per second, uh, you know, and we are evolving the capabilities as the requirements are evolving. And we also have a multiple access. We, multiple access allows us to, uh, to provide, uh, to stay in contact with our science mission, uh, like a 911 nine, uh, call if the mission has, uh, has any issue or problem, needs to do something. So it sends a, a message back to the mission control center to get that kind of service done. Uh, so it's low data rate. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we, we do support other science missions like the Hubble, all of the beautiful images that you are getting from deep space, where you know, all of the galaxies that we are discovering and we are seeing is brought to you thanks to, thanks to TDRS. Um, now, going into, uh, and TDRS is a concept that evolved during the 1970. The technology relied on what was there, what, uh, whatever was there in the 80s and the 90s and, 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 and so on. Uh, it architecturally, uh, did not evolve uh, that much. In the meantime, 
So it did not benefit from advances in technology. In the meantime, NASA, as well as other government agencies, have been working on evolving the technology. So we got into laser communications. You know, uh, optical communication demonstrated uh, great uh, potential on the ground. You know, long haul communication. Now every every home now is kind of serviced via optical uh, fibers on the ground. So the same concept we are taking to space, the ability to have much larger bandwidths to support much higher data rate for the same weight and volume and power requirements. So the optical communication does reduce the burden on the user. It gives you, a, you know, an equivalent of up to two order magnitude in performance for the same volume and power uh, and mass requirements. So that's where we are going. We've demonstrated the technology. Recently, a few years back, actually, um, five years ago, no, four and some, you know, to be precise, we flew a mission to the moon called LADI. And on that LADI, we, have a, we had a laser demonstration. We were able to transmit uh, a signal from the moon to Earth at 622 megabit per second from the moon to here with limited capability, small aperture on the ground as well as in space. So the technology now, we, have, we continue to evolve it. We have the, next, the second generation optical uh, laser, laser capabilities that will be deployed in the next uh, generation data relay uh, satellite. The beauty about uh, laser communication, the, the laser beam is pretty thin, pretty small, you know, pixel, uh, you know, uh, 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 thin. So it provides some level of security. On top of that, we are working on quantum entanglement and quantum key distribution to allow us even maximum security. Uh, beyond the, uh, the security aspect you are talking about and, and the, the large bandwidths, uh, you are talking about uh, the, the, the fact that laser communication and optical communication operating in a wavelength that's not regulated by regulatory agencies. Presently, you know, we have a problem if you are to go from government to non-government, you know, near Earth to deep space, uh, you know, you have to use different spectrum. So a spacecraft that needs to go from one place to the other will need to have multiple payload. So, and by having so many payloads on board, you know, you are taking room and space that could be occupied by other scientific instruments. You could be collecting more science. Now, laser comp can replace all of this, it will allow you uh, to uh, cross across all of these boundaries uh, without, without any problem and will allow you to broadcast to Earth because the wavelength that we've selected is pretty healthy and, and safe uh, to the human eye. So uh, we don't expect much, much of a problem transmitting directly to Earth or transmitting to another dedicated ground uh, terminal or to go through a data relay satellite. So we are going for maximum flexibility in the future, allowing our uh, users to have, uh, you know, uh, always uh, an optimum way to get to their destination. And so we are working uh, along with that, we are working the uh, a cognitive technology that will do uh, the, the adaptive routing process based on uh, a priori, you know, knowledge of the behavior of the network, the, uh, the state of health of the individual channels, and it's supported by uh, a more flexible, more robust, uh, data communication protocol. We are going from the TCP IP to something we call disruption tolerant networking. So that will allow us to, to, to you know, an automated way to store and forward. So if you add the cognitive processes, you will do it in a, in a smart way, you know, in a more optimized way. So we have developed the standards. We are working within CCSDS, which is the Consultative Committee for Data Standards. It's an international organization to produce the kind of standards that will allow international interoperability. We are trying to, we are working with the commercial sector to infuse them into this organization and to work together to ensure that future standards are compatible such that we can interoperate. Because NASA's optimum goal is to push the technology to enable the commercial sector such that these services can be provided by commercial providers, and NASA will not need in the future to build these kind of capabilities. They can, be, can become a user like any other user, and we can focus primarily on advancing the future technology. We will be going after quantum communication in the near time frame, so we'd like to get there, and it's going to take all of us working together. Thank you. That's all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. And you can find additional information at nasa.gov slash TDRS. That's T-D-R-S.